Bear with. Bear with. Well, as always, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. But uh, it's that time of the week. It's a Monday. And uh, it's time to engage once more in a little celluloid management oversight. On this episode, uh, we're talking with the one and only Mr. Steve Norton. He is one of the editors-in-chief over with our friends over at ScreenFish.net and a contributor here at uh, In the Seats as well. His choice was uh, to dive into the canon of one Mr. Martin Scorsese, and we take a look at uh, the uniquely themed but incredibly influential uh, King of Comedy, which came out in the early 80s and is streaming now on Amazon Prime. We really get to dive into it, but before we do that, don't forget to uh, go uh, give us a like and subscribe wherever you get our podcasts, either Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. Give us that five-star rating. Subscribe to the program. And don't forget that you can ar- we archive all of our episodes over our In the Seats YouTube channel. You can give us a like and subscribe there as well. Uh, don't hesitate to follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at In the Seats, or at It's Podcast One. And always pay us a visit over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca. But... Uh, Enjoy our talk with Steve as we uh, as we deep dive into the world of Scorsese and the world of uh, the King of Comedy, which uh, really touches on a lot of things and and, and plays very relevantly for uh, uh, Todd Phillips's Joker, which came out back in 2019, which not a lot of people saw as well. And we talk about that in depth. But uh, enjoy our chat with Steve because between you and me, it's a good one. Well, you know what, boys and girls, it's a Monday once more, which means it's it's time for a little celluloid management oversight. And uh, well, we're doing it with uh, we're doing it well, with one of our close and personals, and we're we're looking at a film that you know has flown under a lot of radars, but it's it's from one of the masters who really uh, uh, who really has gone on to shape sort of a, a generation of filmmakers. And but before we talk about that, we have to talk with the, the our guest, our man of the hour. Uh, from our friend over at screenfish.net and a contributor here at In the Seats, our good man Steve Norton. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks so much, Dave. I, I appreciate I appreciate coming on with anything you're doing. I also appreciate the education. So. <laughs> well, I mean, the second I said I, I was gonna start doing this, you know, I, I could I think we were just talking out of chat, but I could suddenly I could see your eyes light up. I could see your ears perk up because I mean, this is something we've always joked about and talked about, just how You've even said, like, I, there's just a lot of stuff I haven't seen. There's, there's, there's so many. Like, you may be a recurring guest. I mean, I could I could probably do 100 episodes with just you. But Well, at one point, we talked about just, like, a month where you program my life because... <laughs> I'm still up for that, by the way. I, I, as am I. As am I. It's, uh, but, I mean, it, it's true. There, there's a lot. I, I the, the running gag in our conversation is that I haven't seen that. Like you, you list it. I may know what it is. I may know bits about it. It doesn't mean I've actually seen it. Well, we're, we're, we're happy to have you, Steve. And, you know, it, I take it as a personal responsibility to help broaden your education further and foremost. But well, on this episode, we're uh, going back to 1983. And it's a film from one of the uh, modern masters of uh, filmmaking. But it's one of those ones that kind of falls through the gaps a little bit. But it's always one that people draw back to and has been influential in so many ways. It is streaming now on Amazon Prime. Uh, it is The King of Comedy from director Martin Scorsese and starring Mr. Robert De Niro. And it is the story of a uh, a, struggling, a struggling comedian, Mr. Rupert Pupkin. I mean, it's a joke throughout the movie. I could call him Pumpkin or Pup or this or that or whatever. But he he's dying to be a comedian. He's struggling. He wants, he wants to get on his favorite talk show in the worst way, which is hosted by none other than Mr. Jerry Lewis. And he comes up with a harebrained scheme to sort of get on the show by actually kidnapping Jerry Lewis and holding him for ransom. It is as crazy as it sounds, but it's a film that has been so influential in so many realms of dark comedy and has influenced films that we've even seen recently that kind of coexist in the same universe. And I guess my first question for you is, and I mean, I kind of already know the answer, but I'd love to hear it. Why did you want to pick this film in particular? Um, well, you know, it's a great it's a great question because, you know me, like I'm pretty much open, open for anything. I love a Scorsese. But this one in particular, um, I, I, because I hadn't seen it. And one of the films that I absolutely loved in recent memory was Joker with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. And as the film had come out, you know, and even, you know, one of the things that kept coming up over and over again was the idea that this film 
uh, borrowed, shall we say, a lot from from Scorsese's film. Um, I see exactly how much he borrowed, including De Niro, uh, <laughs> um, which I will say adds a very interesting layer to his conversation that he got, became famous for, which is superhero movies or theme park rides. Yeah. Uh, there's a very interesting layer there that I hadn't considered before I saw this. Um, but, but you know, people kept talking about, well, it's very similar to King of Comedy. So when you you gave me some suggestions, and that's why this one was sort of stuck out in my mind as one that I'd, I'd like to see, because I, I would love to have seen the comparisons with. Well, and I mean, you're right, because I mean, King of Comedy does sort of exist in that world of the Joker. Scorsese was very coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, an executive producer on Joker. But I mean, really, when you look at this film... It, it's such a statement on it's a very much a statement on New York, but it's also a statement on just sort of sort of the aspirations of show business in general and just sort of how easily people can blur the lines between reality and fantasy. I mean, there's there's so many things we can pull through, even from Scorsese's canon. Like there are some similarities to Taxi Driver, which you may or may not have seen. Again, I don't know, but it's one of those films where you're drawn into this sort of manic performance by De Niro because he's not playing standard De Niro. He He's playing a dweeb, but he's playing a terrifying dweeb. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm kind of curious, like, as you were watching it, have you ever seen De Niro sort of hit these levels before? Because we've seen him be terrifying. We've seen him be funny. But this, I think, was the first time we've seen him do sort of unstable. I, I like that you described it as unstable because he wasn't really funny, but he's not, uh, but he's not evil. There's a, there's an incredible darkness over his character. I would say he's the bad guy, but there was something like, there's something relatable about his character in, in, in some ways he's very, maybe human is a word better than relatable human about his character. Um, but there's a darkness to him, especially that you get from, from the best of De Niro. Um, I found his character really, really interesting in that way, because you're right. There hasn't been a lot of time we've seen him strike this balance, especially later on in his career. Uh, he's almost making fun of all the things that he did earlier on. In career. It's not almost, he's literally making fun of the things he did early on his career or fully doing what he did early on in his career. You know, you've, you've got these, these mob films that are coming in even later on in his career, but then he starts doing things like analyze this and analyze that, which are making fun of the fact that he does the mob films. Um, but this is such a unique balance for him in that he's almost uh, terrifyingly innocent, but also quite guilty at the same time. I, I, it was I, as I was watching, it, it's quite a unique blend for for De Niro in particular. No. And I mean, it's definitely one of those films where you can see him sort of doing the work and sort of giving us something different or at least trying to give us something different. And I think that really parallels with Scorsese as well, because when you look at Scorsese's sort of yeah. history before this, he had obviously done things like Mean Streets and Alice didn't live here anymore, which were like these very small films. Then Taxi Driver blew up and then New York, New York flopped. But then he went to sort of he had his heart attack and went to Raging Bull and then King of Comedy. Like when you look at Scorsese, his canon basically through the 80s which consists of raging bull king of comedy after hours color of money and last temptation of christ were all films that were not what we associate scorsese with and i, I find that really really quite interesting to be honest because it's one of those things where this feels like to me this feels like the the movie where not just de niro but scorsese as well are kind of trying to break out of the pigeonhole that maybe had been created. And I mean, I'm curious from your thoughts on that, because just from his from a historical standpoint, this feels like them sort of pushing against what maybe is expected of. Well, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, I thought that the film, of course, now again, I'm looking through it through lens of having seen Joker first. I admit. Right. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think this film was ahead of its time in the sense that um, this, to me, through this lens, strikes me as a film about mental health. Yeah. Um, but... In 1983, we didn't have language for that. No, this would be true. the sort of thing you'd say, oh man, this guy's this guy's a nut job. Yeah. You know, he's an obsessive nut job and all this stuff. But I mean, now we look back and it's like, hold on, hold on. There's some unique uh intricacies going on with his character because I mean he doesn't use a real gun. He he's not really trying to do damage. Mm. He's just willing to do damage 
or, or fake damage in yeah. order to get his way, uh, which of course he eventually does. Um, and I will say, I mean, Scorsese's films too, I think are particularly beautiful, uh, oftentimes in their visuals. I loved the color in this film. Like, yeah. I, loved it. I was obsessed with it the whole way watching it. I thought it was just stunning visually. It made me wonder, and again, just through things I've already seen and reflecting right. back on them, it made me wonder if this was an influence for Untouchables, which came out in 87. Um, because the, the Palma, but yeah, no, there's definitely, you can definitely see sort of the use of color and just sort oh, of yeah. how that was such a trend, especially through sort of the early to the mid 80s and how those pastels and just sort of putting it on there was was really something that filmmakers wanted to do and did do. And it, 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 it's kind of marvelous because even when you look at sort of Scorsese's canon, like he he's admitted that the films of uh, like Powell and Pressburger uh, from, you know, like the 40s, which had these, these, these rich and lush uses of color were big influences on this film. And you can see that really when you put it together. And I mean, it's again... I'm I'm constantly amazed at this film because I mean even back in the day they originally wanted Johnny Carson to play the Jerry Lewis role but Johnny wouldn't do it because it was going to sort of he didn't want to influence you know sort of people with mental health issues because I mean especially when this was happening back in the day you know Reagan was getting shot at John Lennon got shot mm -hmm. those things were happening I was kind of curious what did you think of the use of Jerry Lewis in this because I mean I really thought he tends to get underrated as an actor because I mean obviously his earlier sort of slapsticky canon is what people know him for but as the jaded sort of entertainment professional i thought he was fantastic in this oh i i thought he was great uh and and actually it's ironic that, you, that in some ways to ask me that because i think that what he did there is what de niro does now which is you know send up the character that you know and maybe even show you that side that maybe he hasn't been able to show you before um and i mean lewis in this film you know, there is no moment where Lewis loses it. And he slaps Sandra Bernhard in the face. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you're looking for some sort of manic. You're looking for some sort of explosive moment. Um, he doesn't give you that, which I think was is very against type for him, like you said. And I think yeah. it shows like, but but he also like he understood the assignment. Like he's in there. He, you could tell that he sort of understood this world. Um and his character is so interesting. Even the fact that they say, like, he goes out in public because that's where he feels safe. He walks yeah. on these streets because he feels safe. Um, but he's mobbed everywhere he goes. Yeah. And, uh, so, no, I thought I thought he was excellent in this film. And, I mean, it's so amazing because, I mean, really, when you think of, I mean, when you think of Scorsese, now you think of these broad sort of sweeping ensemble pieces. But back in the day, it was small character driven stuff. And this is like, this is essentially a three person play with yeah. De Niro, Jerry Lewis and Sandra Bernhardt. And I mean, they, they do all the work in this film and to see people sort of really get to tear into material like this is, is, is amazing. And I mean, and just to sort of dovetail off that, because again, like we do this every week, we watch new releases, we write stuff up and we're always complaining. We're always going, Oh my God, I, I missed that. Or I've got to catch up to that. Or what happened with this? And Oh my God, somebody saw that. Oh, that's good. Oh no. I, I you know, I still haven't seen squid game. So, I mean, that's, and that's entirely on me, but I mean, I'm kind of curious from your perspective, why do you think things fall through the cracks? Is it hours in the day? Is it just not knowing what to look for or being overwhelmed by choice? I'm always kind of curious on the perspective of why we don't watch enough or why we feel like we don't watch enough. Oh, I, I think I think hours in the day is one thing. I also think legacy matters. So yeah. for for example, for example, this when you you know, the question is whether or not we consider this a classic film. You know, we can answer that. When you think of Scorsese, this isn't the first film that people think of. They think of no, Taxi it's not. Driver. Yeah, it's not. So you have to be passionate about hitting those deep cuts for a film like this, especially when, like you said, there is an onslaught and a flood of new content. Netflix has 10 different movies a day, it feels like. <laughs> it, it's impossible. It's just it's just nonsense. Right. It's like, oh, my gosh, I can't keep up with all this stuff. So a film like this, even if they'd referenced it with Joker, yeah, you know, like that get, that put it in in the in my frontal lobe, if you will. But it didn't make me go, I'm going to watch that tonight because you know what? There's another episode of The Amazing Race, 
or there's a new, or there's a new this, or there's a new that, and everything new and shiny that's shoved in front of us just distracts. And and hours in the day, you you're gonna pick and choose what you want. I think that, and and to add to that, I think that goes back to the comment about. Uh, when Scorsese talked about the, you know, the uh, people don't watch anything other or superhero movies or theme park rides. I think it's the IP. Yeah. Like if somebody sat down and said to me, hey, these two films are very similar. What do you want to watch? Instinctively, I'm going to watch. I'm probably going to watch Joker just because yeah. I'm familiar with the IP. For sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways, I saw that film again here. But that's not that's not slamming either film. I just didn't I just didn't realize the connection between a lot of films borrow from other films. I get it. But I think that the the attractiveness of an of something that you know and is familiar is just gonna draw you probably a nine times out of ten. No, and you're right, because I mean it's it's one of those things that I always marvel at because I mean, and like you said, generally from the from the general public standpoint. The King of Comedy is regarded as more of a deep cut when it comes to Scorsese. But when you really dig into it, you see how many people have been influenced by it and sort of love it as a film from sort of modern day comedians like Jack Black or Steve Carell or even filmmakers from back in the day like Akira Kurosawa, who lists it as one of his favorite films of all time. Mm. And I mean, on the obvious influences that it had on Joker, which I mean, Scorsese was there, so he gave it his blessing. But it's again, it's it's so important to understand, I guess, the packaging of it all, like which again, like you say, is IP. You can still tell sort of some of these really interesting and compelling stories because, like you say, this is very much a story about mental health. Joker was a little flashier about it, a little more violent about it, but in but this, in many ways feels more terrifying to me because there is no the violence was so minimal yeah. to me this has more of an impact but again as more more of an impact as more of a educated viewer to understand what's going on joker gives us the same message but with a bit more of a blunter instrument whereas this was more of like a fine you know fine tooth comb kind of thing yeah ironically i think joker goes a little more scorsese than scorsese does in 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 king of comedy yeah i think you're right um it, you can you can see they they got to take it to the nth degree to to sort of leave its mark um i will i will say this um you know watching it on amazon prime it's labeled as ages seven up so watching it with my 11 year old and my seven year old was a really interesting experience. And uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that and I'm like, I mean, I guess he doesn't like bludgeon anyone with a, with a knife, but I mean like seven plus really Amazon. Okay, sure. All right. Sure. Which, which is, which is a good reminder to everyone listening out there that the ratings listed on these <laughs> streaming sites are a helpful guide but they're not gospel. Sometimes you've got to dig a little deeper. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my my kids just really want to get on TV now. I'm telling you right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's uh, I I do think that when you look at when you look at that sort of leaning in terms of what draws you to people I, or what draws you to certain things, uh, familiarity matters. And in our current current culture, Scorsese is familiar with a certain style of filmmaking that people who love cinema are more drawn to. But I think, you know, like when younger people uh, think of Scorsese, they think of Manny Hates Marvel movies and The Irishman was six hours long, you know, (laughs) you think of. No, but I mean, it's, 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 uh, I mean, it's a sad reality, but I mean, it's true. And I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where, like you say, everything shiny and new is so distracting on such a constant basis. And it almost feels like every week or every other week, you and I hear the words, oh, this is a classic or that is a classic. I'm kind of curious from your perspective, what makes something classic? Because you and I both know that A, it's going to be subjective, but, but B, like I said before, the word gets thrown around way too much. Oh, I think I think classic is like the word love. Yeah. I love that. Well, okay, you know, what's the line in The Simpsons? Is that the love between a man and a woman or the love between a man and a fine Cuban cigar? Like, I mean, like, <laughs> classic, I think, is one of those words that has sort of become that thing. Like, it, you're right, thrown around. I mean, oh, man. I think classic can mean any number of things. Classic can mean that it has a lasting legacy of popularity. A film like uh, a film, a film like Citizen Kane is a classic. But Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, I consider a classic, and they're not on the same level. 
um, because it left a legacy that makes me really want to, that, that, that I think is fantastic. I think if we were to really delve into the meaning of the word, I think you'd look at influence. Yeah. And, and I think on that level, on that level, you could call this a classic. However, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a classic Scorsese because it doesn't, it, because it goes against so many of Scorsese's tropes. You know what I mean? What Scorsese is known for, it sort of goes against those things. I would say Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, classic Scorsese's. But I would say because of the influence of this, I would consider it a classic, if that makes any sense at all. No, it does. And I mean, I, I'm kind of curious for you after having seen this, does it inspire you to maybe go after some of the other more deep cuts, especially from this period, like uh, After Hours or Color of Money or uh, Last Temptation of Christ? Like, if you haven't seen them, of course, you know? Like, Well, Dave, I think you already know the answer to <laughs> that <laughs> should we well, well should we play that game? On Disney Plus, should, so that we, will be a sequel of the coming up in a few weeks. You know, one day, one day we should do this. We should play a game, and we and, and we'll see. We'll see. Just pick, and I'm not talking deep cuts. Just take like ten films, which like the average cinemaphile or a cinephile would say that they've seen and love, and let's see that are pre the year 1990. And, and, I, and I guarantee you that it's a low list. Uh, but no, I, like, you know me, I'm actually always willing to go back into deep cuts. I need a reason to do it. Mm. Um, like on a Tuesday night, if my wife's gone to bed early and I'm just sitting around, I'm probably not going to say I'm going to throw down a deep cut from Scorsese from 1979. Right. Yeah. But for some, this is that's why I love what you're doing here is because it's a great reason for me to revisit it because I, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was really, really good. And I think it was sadder than they probably would have even recognized. I, I can see a lot of people in 1983 saying, what the heck did I just watch? Yeah. And I, I from my understanding, despite its legacy, uh, 40 years later, my understanding, despite its legacy, is that it was sort of received that way, saying this isn't the guy that we want. This isn't the Scorsese we know or the De Niro we know. Yeah. But looking back on it, um, it's like, dang, there's a lot here. Like this is a this is a really smartly written film in a, in a lot of ways. Well, and it really does speak to what uh, Martin was going through at the time as well, because mm. this was in the sort of chunk of years where he had had the heart attack, he had mm. had the health issues. I mean, mostly from doing too much cocaine, but you know that's that happens, boys and girls. So you know, <laughs> drugs are bad. Age is seven plus. It'll be yeah. nice. <laughs> But I mean, it's such a telltale statement of when you see artists develop and they have sort of a peak and a valley, and then they eventually hit this moment where if they can sustain it, they're just sort of throwing their middle finger up and going, you know what, I'm going to tell the stories I want. If you like it, great. If not, go away. And well, this feels to me like one of those stories that back in 82, 83, people weren't ready for. But now they're definitely a little more receptive to it, especially given what they, what happened with Joker and how Scorsese got to produce on that and sort of maybe amp up some of the things that wanted to be told in that story, in his original story over in Joker. Well, and I, and I think, too, I, I love I hadn't even thought of the fact that, you know, Reagan had been shot. Uh, Lennon had been shot like the year before. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a film that was coming out at a time where, again, now. Obviously, I wasn't old enough to remember this era. Um, I was five, six, five or six when this came out. But the idea that uh, the relationship between uh, man and celebrity and man in pop culture was starting to shift. Yeah. Is is really, really interesting to me. And I see a ton of that now that you say it. I see a ton of that in this in this film. And, you know, nowadays I think we're more savvy to the way things were. We're not savvy to the way things are. Yes. Um, and, and we're constantly trying to keep up and, and see that. And I think the relationship between, like the saddest part of this, this film in a lot of ways is the success he finds at the end. Yeah. Which is very network. Like I, I compared this a lot in my mind. I saw, I saw a connection with network uh, in this film in a, in a obviously different story, different way, but the idea of the, the madness creating the celebrity uh, yeah. um, was, yeah. was wild. It was wild. And uh, yeah, I think, I thought it was a fascinating, fascinating film. And, you know, it's all born out of that concrete jungle as well. Cause I mean, especially, I mean, in the eighties and like, like late seventies and the eighties where, where Scorsese was making so many of his classic films, uh, it was not a nice place. It was it was it was occasionally an ugly place. And I mean, I I think this still serves as a reminder even now 
given what's going on in the world and this, that, and the other, that like sort of the edifice of the city where people have viewed it as the place where you go to succeed and get rich and do that can be a cold and ugly place. Yeah, it's interesting that a film like this wasn't located in Hollywood. <laughs> it it, it could have been. Yeah. It could have been. Had it been had it been made in the late eighties, this was totally a Hollywood story. You're absolutely right, but it was right on the precipice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It uh, it really it really is interesting that looking back that it's again now he you know Scorsese is obsessed with New York, but I mean this is very much a New York story, like you said. It didn't have to be. Um, but it's of the time, it, though. Yeah, I guess that's of the time. Of course, you're right. You're right. See, again, looking back at 1983 through 2022. Yeah. We, this film's almost 40 years old. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is wild to me. And, and it, you know, I know I keep going back and talking about Joker, um, but I think that makes it so much more appropriate. It's not like. No, they, it does. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Th- this is a, this is an honoring of a, of a previous piece. Um, and giving it modern sensibilities um, because I mean, in that particular film, it actually identifies the mental health aspect far more clearly. Whereas again, in 1983, I don't think they just had the language for it. Yeah. Um, like it, I think they would just argue about it being about obsession and, and it is, I mean, it very much is, but uh, man, my goodness, it's uh, it's, it's really something. I really enjoyed it. So I guess just to put a bow on this, and I mean, I think you've kind of already answered this, but would you define this as a classic to me for just based on talking to you? I would say yes, but sort of with the asterisks. I, I think yes, with an asterisk. I think yes, because again, the influence that it has. Yeah. I think we, I think we tend to call something a classic if it's old and we like it. Right. Um, you know, uh, eventually Iron Man, uh, maybe even now, Iron Man will be called a <laughs> classic Marvel film. <laughs> You know, Avengers is a classic cinematic universe. Uh, but I think I think the the echoes and influence of this film, whether it's whether it's a film like Joker or whether it's just the influence of the way it was using color and and character, I think. And, and as you've said, I didn't know that Kurosawa said it's one of his favorite films. I think I think for that reason, it's absolutely a classic. Uh, I don't know if it, uh, if the casual film goer will will enjoy the ride. Right, um, it, but I I thought it was really well done for those. So, for, yeah, for those looking to go a little deeper, it's, it's definitely Absolutely. one that's going to have rewards for it for sure. For sure. Now, I mean, Steve, just to put a bow on this, thanks for once again for joining us and undertaking a little uh, celluloid management oversight with us today. Now, I mean, just to like tell the beautiful people out there in the world where they can find you, other than once in a while over at In the Seats. <laughs> he does great work for us I, I appreciate that and you know i thank you so much you know i love i love chatting with you about anything whether you're on with us or whether i'm on with you at any time and i certainly need some celluloid management oversight so that, <laughs> that that's fair um yeah thank you i mean uh you can find all our stuff over at our team at screenfish.net's or our site uh we try and look at pop culture from a little bit of a different point of view try and get to the questions about what a film is actually trying to connect with more deeply and how it connects with our culture and and some of the deeper ideas uh of the film um you can also find us uh wherever podcasts are available look for screenfish radio uh, you can also find us on YouTube uh, and in the, and on podcast and on the interviews, you'll also find, for, well, you'll find Screenfish Radio, which is uh, weekly conversations about current films that are out there and try and get some conversations with great people such as, such as Dave, who's on a bunch of times. Uh, I love having him on. Um, but you'll also find interviews with uh, with industry professionals as well, where they tell us a little bit about the projects they're working on. And, uh, and that's been a lot of fun too. So you can look for us in the, Look for us any pretty much anywhere. <laughs> well, very much in the spirit of what we do here at In the Seeds, and we love it. So go check them out, absolutely. And Steve, thanks again for the time, man. This was a lot of fun. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Thanks so much, Dave. All right. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>